Lord be with you. I had an organist say to me one time, you know how everybody goes home for Christmas? I said, yeah. He goes, this church is where they go from. And I'm beginning to think that maybe August is the day that we all go on vacation. But it's good to see you. The faithful are here. Um, this morning, let's keep in our prayers, please. Um, Brenda Davis, who is Tracy Paul's mother, and she's been suffering from pneumonia and was put in the hospital in Durham last night, and Tracy's there taking care of her. Uh, John Holshauser had heart surgery a week ago and is doing real well from the heart surgery, but he's had kidney failure since then. And his daughter says he's only got one kidney, so he's sedated and we're just waiting to see what happens. So keep them in your prayers. And Jim Tubner's had his medication changed and he could use some prayer too. So let's keep them in our prayers and let's prepare ourselves to worship God. Shall we stand for the call to worship? If you're able, please stand. I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is above all and through all and in all. Each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head. Let us worship God, and together let us pray. O God of grace and infinite goodness, you nourish us with the bread of life 
and sustain us with the peace that sets our longing hearts at rest. You fill our cup with kindness. It overflows with the bounty of your all-encompassing care. You choose to dwell among us and in us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. We praise you and adore you, O God of us all.
God's grace welcomes us all and reminds us that we are not perfect. And so let us pray and confess our sins. God of mercy, mercy. be above above us us to judge us us, and be be within within us to convict convict us of our sin. Teach Teach us who worship worship false false gods to fear you, the the one one true God. God. Teach Teach us who commit evil deeds to obey you and you you alone. alone. Teach Teach us who oppress our neighbors the ways of righteousness and truth. Teach Teach us who do not pursue peace, the futility of war, and the blessing of shalom. And God feeds us on the bread of life. And in Jesus Christ, we find our sins are indeed forgiven and our life renewed. Amen.
Laura's at the beach. So I'm supposed to do the children's sermon. There was a time when I could just get up and make up a children's sermon at the, off the top of my head, but I'm old now. But yesterday at Subway, it was a bad Subway as Subways go, but at Subway yesterday, somewhere in South Carolina, they, they said, what kind of bread do you want? And that always paralyzes me because I can't find the list. And when you do find it, there's eight things on it and they all have long names. And I finally said, I want the crunchy kind like you just served that guy. And the woman said, oh, the cheesy bread, that's good. So whew, that was the best part of my sandwich, but that's immaterial. So children, the cheesy bread, you know, there's all kinds of bread in this world. And all of it is good. And Jesus, you know, comes along and, and says he's the bread of life. And so he, he eats all bread. He eats the bread that he had. But it stands for all the other kinds of bread in the world. And so when he says he satisfies our hungers, um, it's because he can stand for all those different kinds of bread that he can do that. And so we, uh, we all give thanks to Jesus for, for his bread, the bread of life, and, and for the way that he satisfies all of our needs. So, children, don't let that escape you. He is with us and will satisfy whatever we need. Thanks be to God. Now, we're going to read from John 6, because uh, even though I said I was going to preach from Ephesians, and that's what she put in here, sometimes the lectionary has nothing, and sometimes it's got three good passages. So I was working on Ephesians, but I kept looking at John, and so I finally said, forget it, I'll just read, we'll read John. So John 6, 24 to 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, the food that in, which is the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The word of the Lord. Well, if you were to go to an In-N-Out restaurant in California, they don't have them over on this coast, but on the west coast, they're everywhere. They're very good hamburger joints. And if you know the secret lingo that's not anywhere on the menu, you can get a very creative kind of hamburger. So for instance, you can go in there and say, I want my hamburger protein style. And that means they don't put a bun. They put instead extra slabs of meat, one on top and one on the bottom. 
So you get this concoction with three big slabs of meat and some stuff in the middle. Well, that seems to ruin the classic notion of what a hamburger is, but you may disagree. Jesus said he's the bread of life. Bread keeps us alive. Bread keeps us fed. And we need more than bread. We need vegetables and fruits and proteins. We need nutrients that bread doesn't have, but we do need bread. And bread sustains us in the journey of life, gives us what we need for that journey. And Jesus is the bread of life who satisfies our deepest hungers. So what hungers do we have? Many people these days find that life has very little meaning. They go through their days, day after day, doing the same thing, over and over, rinse and repeat. There seems to be little to it that matters. They want meaning. And related to that meaning is a a lack of purpose. I've talked about teleology before. It's the sense that things are moving toward a goal or an end. They have a purpose. And without a purpose, it just feels like we're doing things just for the sake of doing them. And human life was designed for more than that. You know, we want to make a lasting contribution, to leave a legacy, to make a concrete contribution to the world, whatever it is. We want to cure cancer or run for president, or become a teacher and make a difference in a child's life. We want to write great books and show people the way forward. So we want to demonstrate our purpose and meaning in a way that helps other people see their own purpose and meaning. We want to matter, you know? And I think that's where the desire for wealth and fame comes in. For some people, those are very important. When you think about it, those things aren't very substantial. I mean, really, the Kardashians, for instance, are famous. But for what? I mean, Dad used to be a lawyer, and he died. What contribution have any of these people made to society? I don't know. We have a hunger, though, and some people have that hunger for wealth and fame. Most of us have a hunger for security. Our age has been called the age of anxiety, and we, we long for security. We want to keep the wolf away from the door. We want security against criminals and intruders, against hunger and poverty, against illness against the terrors of old age, against warfare and conquering armies, against the Caesars of the age. And we're anxious about all these things. And underneath all of it, and we don't talk about this much anymore, we're anxious about the bomb, nuclear war. Back when Reagan was president, threatening nuclear war every five minutes. Um, I had a friend in Princeton, and that guy used to pose an interesting question for us. He said, you know, we're in a research town halfway between New York City and Philadelphia. So if the bombs go off, you know one's going to hit Princeton, or a dozen or something. What will you do once you're told the missiles are coming? That was his question. And one guy said, I go in my room and pray. Another guy said, well, I I hope the phones would be working so I could call my mother. Another guy said, I'll go in the basement and hide, try to survive, see what happens afterwards. And then we looked at the guy who asked the questions and said, well, what would you do? He said, I'm going up on the roof, put my lawn chair down facing northeast, put on my sunglasses, pour a drink, and wait for the flash. not a bad answer, really. You don't want to survive a nuclear holocaust. But we're anxious about all these things. 
We want something to take away the anxiety that cripples us and leaves us unable to decide what to do. We want somebody to tell us what to do, what to believe, how to behave, what's next. That's, I think, why so many people in the world are so comfortable with authoritarian leaders. They want to be told what to do, which lessens their anxiety. And finally, we have a hunger for relationship. We, we just want to be with another person who understands us and cares for us. And we're, we're built for relationships, and without them, it's, it's hard. We, you know, we think we're doing all right alone, but we're not. We're not meant to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone, the Bible says. We can't live in isolation from one another. I remember asking my political philosophy professor one day why I had to obey any laws. I said, I never signed any social contract. No one ever asked me if I wanted to be a part of this American thing. I was just born into it. So why can't I just declare this little space around me my own country and be independent? And he laughed a little bit and said, because they have the police and the army. I think he had a point. You can't just live alone. Sometimes I laugh at the great state of Texas. Periodically they say, well, we're different from the rest of you and we're going to secede from the union and you can't do anything about it. I say, all right. We did fight a war about that, but okay. Just secede then and all will be well, except, you know, you're assuming the borders are going to be open. No. -uh. You're assuming that they'll be easy, you know, you can just travel no. You're assuming that we will buy your stuff and sell you stuff. No. You're going to be alone. And, you know, can you eat oil? You can't live in isolation from other people, Texas. And we're all in this together. We can't live in isolation either. So how does Jesus feed any of these hungers? Well, first of all, he brings meaning to our lives. We find that you know, we have something worthwhile to do. We live for him, we share his love, and we do that in, in concrete, real ways with the people around us. So he gives us meaning and purpose. And, and we begin to see the beauty of the world that's around us. Protestants are kind of scared of beauty most churches are not nearly as pretty as this one. We don't want to decorate our buildings too much. We don't want to be like those Catholics. But once you got the love of God in your life, then you see the beauty of the world that God made. And everything has a kind of beauty once you begin to see it. And I think we find our hunger for wealth and fame begins to fade. We just don't need those things, you know? We're happy to do whatever it is we find ourselves doing in the world. And we learn to be satisfied with lesser offices than the presidency. We don't need to rule the world to make a difference or be famous. We just become content with our place in life. And our hunger for security and our anxieties begin to lessen. We're, we're much less afraid. And we should be less afraid. Of what do we have to fear? The only thing the world can do is kill us. And in Christ, we've already died. Might sound a little radical, but it's true. We have nothing to be anxious about. Now, we still have all kinds of anxieties. We're anxious about things that are real and things that we imagine. We like to play the what if game. 
And back in Glen Burnie, you know, in the 80s, the church was a few miles away from Baltimore Washington Airport. And if you look out the window, you can see the airplanes taking off. And they go so slow when they're taking off. And they make this little turn. And if you look up just as they're making that turn, it looks like they're stopped. And they're just going to fall. And so when the what if stuff would start in a meeting, I would say, yeah, what if? What if, what if an airplane just fell out of the sky and landed on our church? They would realize kind of how ridiculous they were being. But what if? Don't worry about it. You know, even if the missiles are fired, so what? I just don't want to know. You know, I don't want to panic for 20 minutes. Just don't tell me. Well, I once took a tour of the Pentagon. It's a marvelous building, by the way. It's a gigantic thing, five-sided circle. And in the middle is a huge park. And in the middle of the park is a little building. It's a snack bar where they sell ice cream and lemonade to the workers who are out there in the middle having lunch. That's not what the Russians thought it was. At some point, we found out that the Russians decided that little building's where they keep the real secrets. Because that's how Russia would do it. They'd build a big fortress, and they'd put the secrets in the middle. It's just a snack bar. So they all sit around laughing at how the Russians are going to nuke the snack bar in the middle, and all they're going to do is, you know, melt some ice cream. We don't have to be anxious, even about that stuff. And Jesus also feeds our hunger for relationships. He made us, and so he's the one who can complete us and make our souls whole. And there's a God-shaped hole in the middle of our being, and only God can fill that hole. So our hunger you know, leads us to look for love in all the wrong places. It's satisfied by Jesus Christ. And that's where we find our hunger satisfied and our needs met. He feeds us with the bread of life. And Alexander Schmemann, who is a theologian in Paris, said, he is our bread because from the very beginning, all our hunger was a hunger for him, and all our bread was but a symbol for him, a symbol that has become reality. Jesus is our bread, and in him we have life. And at communion, he feeds us. We partake of him and his nature. We become by grace what he is by nature, one of the ancient church fathers wrote. So we come to his table. We come to the table, and there we find the bread of life. And we eat our fill of the bread of life. You've only got a little tiny chiclet thing, but you know, symbolically, we're eating our fill. And our hungers are satisfied. And our needs are met. Because he loves us that much. Thanks be to God. Amen.
affirmation of faith today is taken from Ephesians chapter 4. Let us read it together. There is one body and one spirit, just as we were called to the one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up into every way into him who is the head in Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, and each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. may be seated. We've expanded the prayer 
we've gone back to using the responses and stuff. So hopefully we can keep it up. But know that Jesus is himself the bread of life and invites all of us to come and have the bread of life and the cup of salvation and to partake of him because he meets all of our needs. So wherever you are, wherever you've been, and however it is with your faith, you're welcome to come to this table. It is his table. And so let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the, the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, with joy we praise you and give thanks to your name. You commanded light to shine out of darkness. You divided the sea and the dry land, and you created the vast universe and called it good. You made us in your image to live with one another in love. You gave us the breath of life and freedom to choose our way. You proclaimed yourself in covenant with Abraham and Sarah and told us your purpose and commandments through Moses. You called for justice in the cry of the prophets. Through long generations, you have been faithful and kind to all your children. Your ways are just and true. And so we lift our hearts in joyful praise, joining our voices with the Universal Church and the Heavenly Choir. praise you, most holy God, for sending your only Son to live among us, sharing our joy and sorrow. He told your story, healed the sick, and was a friend to sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. And we praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. He is still the friend of sinners. And we trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. And so remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we break bread and share one cup and give thanks for your saving love in Jesus Christ. As you raised him from death and call us with him from death to life, we give ourselves to you to live for him in joy and grateful praise, for great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And so, gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Send us out in the power of the Spirit to live for others as Christ lived for us, announcing his death for the sins of the world and telling his resurrection to all people and nations. By your Spirit, draw us together into one body and join us to Christ the Lord, that we may remain his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. And hear us as we pray the very prayer that he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 On that night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And once he'd given thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so let us partake. And let us pray. Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Amen. When I 